Welcome back to the club, guys. We're talking with Matt Barry from Freelancer about all of his uh, failures, experiences, and being embarrassed to start his new company, the dark days when he was an entrepreneur, and how this led to Freelancer. At the uh, headquarters, in uh, Freelancer. Matt, welcome to the Disruptors Club. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's awesome for you to be here. I guess the question I wanted to understand and, 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 and share with everyone is, how did you come to that decision? Because there's lots of ideas out there to start Freelancer. Um, well, it came out of a bit of necessity is the mother of invention. Um, I didn't come up with the original concept. I stumbled across it. So I had just left uh, Sensory and I'd been running that business for six years, started from scratch. We designed a chip for high performance you know, network traffic scanning. Very, very complicated product, very, very difficult business. I'd raised venture capital. We'd raised tens of millions of dollars of venture capital. We were doing about two and a half million bucks in revenue a year. We had offices and headquarters in Palo Alto, offices in Sydney, Beijing, London. And it was just one of those startup journeys which was just grinding. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners with no experience, you, year after year after year, you're at it and then just haven't, haven't cracked it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the technology's great, the people are great. It's just that, you know, had wrong product market fit. We were too early for market. We're doing gigabit patent matching in a world where there's no gigabit networks. It was like way too early for market. And of course, while we're running the business, we thought way too late to market, mm -hmm. right? Because you had competitors out there trying to do various bits and pieces. But, you know, we had um, dysfunctional venture capitalists who were fighting with each other, if not fighting with us, constantly from, literally from the day one of investment attacking the business and through I guess sheer willpower the business survived way too long right it should have you know bullet had, should have been put in it too early but you know I was determined to try and make it work and after six years it's doing about two and a half million bucks in revenue a year but it was not enough to put the set the world on fire and had 70 staff and it was cash flow negative and you know it got to a point where the VCs was just untenable and I said that's it I'm you know I said uh, you know if you're going to do this I'm just going to consider this my 30 million dollar MBA and uh, walk, and they didn't like that. And there's a very acrimonious split. So I was, you know, it was one of those points in your life where they call it sort of a dark moment in the journey of an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. Um, I felt um, embarrassed to start another company because the other company hadn't gone so successful, successfully well. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt embarrassed to ask people, hey, let's do something new. Um, it was very difficult to raise money because in Australia, if you kind of fail at something, everyone has a go at you. Right, and for two years, literally every question, the first question I would have going into every meeting was, "What happened at Sensory? What happened at Sensory? What happened at Sensory?" Now, years later, it eventually sold to Intel, so it actually had a good ending uh, ultimately. But um, you know, it was just drained, and I was physically drained because I was traveling to the U.S. every month and so forth. So I was just trying to figure out what I'm going to do. So I thought, you know, I want to start a business. I don't want to work for someone else because fundamentally, you know, I think I'm unemployable. But on top of that. I was just not in the right headspace to go work for someone. I was, I was broken, right? And so I was like working, I was actually trading stocks actually, I did pretty well, trading base metal mining stocks uh, at home. And I thought, okay, I've got to actually do something real rather than sit home trading. So I, you know, I was trying to pick up little projects here or there just to kind of get myself busy. And I thought I'd help my mum build a website. Mm. And she runs a wholesale craft, uh, uncraft business, you know, paints and glues and textiles, imports and sells and so forth. And I told her to build a website in 1995. And she would have been one of the pioneers in e-commerce if she had done that. And fast forward to 2007, and there's still no website. So I said, okay, fine, I'll help you build a, a website. Now, I, then I realized shortly thereafter my mistake in offering that when she has 10,000 products with no photos and no description. So I've got to sit there and I've got to do a lot of data entry, a lot of photo taking, a lot of whatever. And it's just a lot of you know, monotonous work. And so I actually needed to get some data entry done and I was trying to get a little brother or sister or a friend of mine to do the job. And I said, listen, I'll pay you $2 per row in Excel. Start off with 1,000 rows. It'll be um, $2,000 worth of work. You can work in your own time, at home on a computer. I would have loved to have had that sort of work if I was at high school or even at uni, early days of uni, it would have been great. And um, you know, I'd find people and they'd tell me the job's boring. I don't know, it was millennials or whatever. I said, no, no, it's boring. I, I would do the job if it wasn't boring. The reason why I'm paying you is because, yeah, it's boring, but it's 2,000 bucks. 
And they'll do work for a while, then they'll say they have exams, they've got university, they've got soccer practice, all sorts of excuses. And after about four months, I just gave up and I just went to Google and I said, okay, online data entry or cheap data entry online or something like that. And I stumbled across this website called Get a Freelancer and it looked terrible. It looked like Craigslist. Um, it was, you know, I say it's designed with paint left over from the USS Midway. It was just like this gray mess. And I had all this activity on it. I just didn't know what was going on. And it looked like you could get some jobs done there. And so I, and you've got to remember, this is 2007. So the concept mm. of getting a job done online, you know, no one had really heard of this, right? And I posted a job, cost me $5 US at the time. And then I went to get lunch. And I actually forgot that I posted the job. And I came back from lunch and my email had just exploded. And there were 73 emails from people saying, I'll do it for 2,000, 1,000, 500, 400, 300, 200, 100. My first reaction was, there's no way that 73 people want to do this job. This can't be real. I can't find someone locally to do it. This just can't be real. This can't be real people. It's just coming in so quickly. It's, just, it's, you know, whatever. And then I thought, why are people bidding $100? I said 2,000 is the budget. Why would someone bid 5% of the budget? This is like really weird. Mm. And then I started talking to people and a really bad interface. You couldn't chat, but you could message and hit submit and wait and eventually you get an email back saying something. So there were people on the other side of it. And I thought, okay, well, I'll give you a go. And I discovered you know, the people coming from a lot of emerging markets, so India, Vietnam, et cetera. And I hired a team and I said, okay, do the, do the work. And three days later, the job was done. It was done perfectly. And I didn't have to pay until the money, the money until the job was done. And my mind just exploded. <laughs> <laughs>